You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. This Week in Futures Options streams live, so be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. That's M-I-X-L-R. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody. That music means we are back for TWIFO this week in Futures Options, a program where we break it all down in the world of all things Futures Options. What's lighting it up over there at CME this week? My name, of course, Mark Longo from TheOptionsInsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever-engaging, ever-educational Options Insider Radio Network. I thank all of you. Take the time to listen and drive up our bandwidth bills every month, getting bigger every month. But it's a good problem to have. And of course, all of you take the time to rate and review the program wherever you get it. It's available on just about every platform under the sun. Even though it's been around for a while, it does help new people continue to discover it. So if you are so inclined, if you like what you hear, you want to throw a few stars our way, it does help new folks discover the content. Quite frankly, there aren't a lot of people out there talking about futures options. So we want more people tuning in and joining the old party. And of course... If you want even more content in your lives, including a fair amount of futures options content as well, then theoptionsinsider.com slash pro is the place to go. We've had multiple guests in our pro Q&A hot seat, including our guest today appearing in that hot seat, Dan Grams and many others talking all things futures options. We get into crypto there as well. A lot of interesting things over there on the pro Q&A hot seat. Options oddities every week as well. Of course, you get nearly 200 hours worth of content already waiting for you on the exclusive pro podcast feed. Live action to this, everything else we do, live access, I should say, to this and everything else we do here throughout the week, giveaways, a whole bunch more. Theoptionsinsider.com slash pro is the place to go. It's a fun party. Come join us over there. We're having a good time. Speaking of having a good time, we're going to have a good time on the show today because we are joined once again by Miss Carly Garner, the senior analyst and broker over there at DeCarly Trading. Carly, welcome back to TWIFO. It has been too long. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. It has been too long. Your ears must have been ringing. We were talking about you <laughs> earlier this week. We got some listener feedback about you. So it's a good ah. time to have you back on the show. All good things. Don't worry. We'll okay, get, good. We'll, we'll, get to, <laughs> we'll get to all that fun in a second. First, let's kick things off the way we are want to do. It is time for the Movers and Shakers Report. 
It's time to find out what's rallying on the light side and falling to the dark side at CME Group this week. It's time for the Movers and Shakers Report. All right, everyone, welcome to the Movers and Shakers, the portion of the show where we break down everything lighting it up to the dark side and the light side over there at CME Group this week. Carly, you know the dance by now. Where should we begin our journey this week? To the light side or to the dark side? I'm feeling like going to the dark side today. All right. Interesting. A lady after my own heart out there. And it looks like an interesting week, kind of an evenly split week, at least when we kicked off the show. I'm sure maybe if we re-racked these a little bit later in the day, given what's going on in equities and some of the other asset classes, now we might be more biased to the dark side. If you want to see this movers and shakers report for yourselves, listeners, you, only one place to go. Actually, technically, there are three. <laughs> if you go to CME Group on Twitter, follow them or follow us at Options on Twitter before Showtime, we tweeted out. Of course, if you want to see this full report and a whole bunch of other stuff we don't have time to touch on on the show every week, only one place for that, Bantix.com, B-A-N-T-I-X.com is the place to go. Click on that free trial link so you can get access to all this cool stuff. We really do just scratch the surface here on Twifo every week. But if you looked at that report on Twitter, listeners, you'd see it's biased to the red, but not entirely. It's close to 50-50. I'd say about 45-55 green versus red out there. But to the dark side we go. Carly has chosen. Number five to the dark side is Palladium. This one's been on our movers and shakers just about every week, it seems like. Palladium moving all over the place. Unfortunately, you know the deal. Not much options paper to speak of out there, but palladium number five coming in at six and a half percent. So in terms of the magnitude of the move, the dark side is definitely winning this week. Number four, we have one of our frequent offenders here. It's Nat Gas off 6.62 percent. It was number one in the other direction last week, up nearly 14 percent, about 13.7 percent. So quite a roller coaster couple of weeks here for Nat Gas. I have a feeling. Carly's going to want to talk about that. I don't know why. Number three, we have Rough Rice off 7.28%. Number two is also one of our frequent offenders out here for the week. It is Bitcoin off 8.14%. It was number four in the same direction last week off 3%. So already, we haven't even finished the dark side. We've got two of our three frequent offenders. Let's see if we can make it a trifecta yet again this week. And number one to the dark side this week, listeners, three months so far off 11.68%. So... Dark side week for the rates out there as well. To the light side, now we go. Number five, we have the E-mini NASDAQ. Haven't seen this one popping up in here. And again, I think if we re-racked this, <laughs> this number might be very different. But 2.21% to the light side. Of course, equities turn into the dark side right now. So I do believe this would be a different list right now. Number four, we have Lean Hogs up 2.3%. Number three, Soybean Meal up 2.63%. Number two is feeder cattle up 3.39%. And the number one light side mover this week, our old friend Oats up 5.02%. It was number five in the other direction last week off nearly 3%. So pretty active couple of weeks for Oats. You know the deal though with Oats. I think they do three contracts a week. So not a lot of paper to sink our teeth into out there in Oats. But I was joking earlier, Carly, but I know you like a little bit of nat gas. Nat gas is moving this week. It's in our movers and shakers. So I think we should start in energy. It's time to tap into the deep options well of black gold, Texas tea, Nat gas, and more. It's time to talk energy. All right, listeners, off to the realm of energy we go. You folks know where to find this in your drop down. See me group.com slash twifo then head over into the asset class drop down you're going to go down three slots to energy then you're going to go over to product family go down three more slots to nat gas and that's where you will find our old friend nat gas this week it's moving it's rocking and rolling off about 0.5 or about nearly 17 percent just this week trading right around two and a half right now out there so giving up pretty much half a buck on the week of course you go all the way back to last week's show and it's off a little less about 6.62 percent but still a banger week here by just about any description not so much a banger on the volume week it's kind of about what we would expect it's 448,000 somewhere around 440,000 is your typical week out there for nat gas from a volume perspective but carly you and i haven't chatted in a little bit and i'm not sure if you've noticed but nat gas has been moving a little bit so i've I've noticed (laughs) what's been catching your eye out there in the world of nat gas carly 
Well, I mean, um, in my opinion, $2 nat gas was kind of the synonymous to $10 nat gas, just extreme prices, probably a lot of large margin call liquidation involved, uh, a lot of just aggressive sec and spec selling, trend fund following, that sort of stuff. Um, so we've we rallied pretty nicely from the $2 area. We've given some of that back. We've given back about half of that, to be honest. It, I'm looking at like the 250 area in May. As long as 250 in May holds, I think that the path of least resistance is higher. Seasonally, the market tends to bottom out right about now. And also, uh, there's a few things, but like spread charts and things that I've seen in some of the Bloomberg terminals for, with uh, some of my colleagues that suggests that a lot of the the price action that we're seeing now is has only occurred in a couple times uh, in the past, and, bo- and most of the time it triggers a, a good size rally, like a um, not just I'm not talking fifty cents or a dollar, but I think we could see four fifty five dollars, believe it or not, by later this year. Ooh, you're talking big moves out there. So I'm yeah, guessing decent size. I'm just gonna put a feeler. I'm guessing you're talking maybe some. I know you like a good bullish risk reversal. Is that what you're slinging out there in that gas? What's the DeCarly trade du jour in that gas right now? Well, a few weeks ago, we had, we came out with an idea with a, it was basically a bull call spread with a naked leg. So we bought a bull a vertical call spread and we sold a put to pay for it. Uh, most of our clients, I believe, almost all of them have gotten out. I hope hopefully they did on Friday. Uh, I think most of them did. Those that didn't were just suggesting to hang on at this point. Hopefully they bought back their short put. That's where the risk is. I can't rule out a retest of lows. I mean, that's unfortunately how markets go. And that gas has a pretty dirty habit of doing that. So I wouldn't be shocked to see us uh, dribble down and just kind of retest the the low two dollars. So if that happens, uh, we'll probably be looking to do something a little more aggressive, maybe a risk reversal or maybe a bull call spread with a naked leg. But at these prices, if you don't have anything on, I'd probably just sit back and and wait for better prices and see what happens. If better prices don't come, um, you know maybe we'll we'll miss something. But knowing that gas, there's generally plenty of opportunities on both sides of the trade. So I think patience is better a virtue here. I knew you liked a good risk reversal out there. In that gas. Yeah, I, I can get behind that bull call spread with a bit of a a short put kicker. Pretty much a risk yeah. reversal with an extra extra leg out there. But I was kind of surprised, Carly. Were you surprised as well when we were starting to flirt with the two handle? I thought I'd come in here on the show and I would see kind of like what you're talking about. Just a ton of upside paper. See the skew heavily biased to the upside and all sorts of premium to the calls. And we didn't see that. In fact, we saw a ton of paper two puts. One and three quarter, even one and a half puts, and then the skew was biased to the downside or kind of flat. Did that surprise you, Carly? More people weren't loading up to the upside. Yeah, I think that was a little surprising to me. Um, I, I also think that people are probably just have natural gas fatigue. I mean, twenty twenty two was was you know people are probably have PS, PTSD trading natural gas. It has been just unbelievable. So I think a lot of it is um, a lot, speculators are starting to step back, and I can't blame them. I like that. Nat gas PTSD. <laughs> I think some <laughs> of our listeners <laughs> may have that right now as well. Yes, I, I could certainly see that. This has definitely been a whipsaw kind of asset class. Still, if you had told me, Carly, back, doesn't seem like that long ago, we were talking about seven, eight, nine, even 10 handle yeah. calls. And now we're talking about one and three quarter puts. I mean, it's just it's still kind of mind blowing to me that we have made such a move. But, it really is a mind blowing move. I agree. <laughs> but alas, that's that's where we are. I'm kind of long now for the old days, Carly, when that gas was kind of sleepy. And if it blew through three dollars to the upside, that was a huge deal. Yeah. That was market moving. That was oh my god, clutch your pearls. Things are going crazy. And now uh, exactly. Nat gas is just triple digit vol for days and all sorts of craziness going on out there. I know. I remember in late 2018, there was a couple, at least one, probably a few more big hedge funds that blew up because they were short natural gas calls uh, with like, and the market rallied basically from $3 to four eighty. <laughs> so that was enough to blow out huge funds. They probably have some nat gas PTSD as well. I <laughs> <laughs> they probably do years <laughs> later. I'm sure they do. Spreading through all of the markets. Let's see if we can cure your PTSD. With a little bit of data, or maybe this is going to scare you. Maybe it's going to give you some flashbacks, in which case, maybe you tune out for this segment out here. Like we said, about the expected amount of paper out here this week, which I was kind of expecting maybe something closer to 600,000 this week, but not quite that case. 448,000, about an average week out here, which is, again, surprising given how much we're moving again out here. What's not surprising is that Nat Gas, once again, trading like an equity. They do need some weeklies out here. Carly, do you agree with that? Do you think they need to start adding some weeklies given how much we're whipping around? 
The folks would clearly like it, I think, if they added them. You know, I think the weeklies would be nice uh, just for hedging purposes. I also wonder, I mean, natural gas options aren't the most liquid in the world. So I, I kind of worry about the liquidity being spread too thin. But um, sure, I, honestly, maybe it'll bring market participants uh, off the sidelines. So maybe just you're right. The way it's been trading lately, ever since these big yeah. moves really started happening, it's trading like an equity. It's all front month, whatever the front month is, right? Right. Uh, so yep. even if it's like a day or two to go, they're still trading it pretty hot and heavy. So there is interest in near dated liquidity. In that gas, so that, I wouldn't mind seeing a few feelers out there because right now the the nearest dated contract is almost twenty days to go. Mm-hmm. People like a, maybe a little bit more bang for their buck. Look at all the zero day stuff going up in all the equities. Right, people like to play close to the fire these days, Carly. Yeah, so, no, I think you make some good points. Next time I get, I get CME on here, I'll, I'll hold their feet to the fire about some pun intended about some about some nat gas weeklies. Would you like to see a nat gas weekly list? I think there might be some interest and maybe that would drum up some of these volume numbers here as well right now 20 days to go that contract is leading the dance uh, nearly 30 percent of the paper going up out there so people clearly want near dated exposure and then the contract right behind it we have the may contract so that is the april contract by the way listeners uh, the may contract doing 27 percent. so it's the first it's the front end of the curve that's getting all the love out here that's a uh, front contract hanging out at two and a half bucks pretty much exactly right now like i said off about 50 cents this week so Nat gas taking the proverbial drubbing. The vol it was over triple digits not too long ago. It's at about an 83 right now, up about five and a quarter points. So still extremely frothy, not quite triple digits, but pretty darn close. Certainly if you compare it to VIX or even some of the other assets we're going to talk about a little bit later, whether it's rates or ags or whatever it might be, an 83 vol is nothing to sneeze at out there. In terms of skew, the puts last week were bid. That seemed to be the winning trade, 5.3% bid. This week, a little bit less bid, 3.2%, but still bid. The calls last week, nobody wanted to touch them, 5.4% cheap. So last week, the skew had it right. Bid the puts, offer the calls. That worked out this week. This week now, puts still a little bit bid. The calls, 1.6% bid. So the calls have gained a little bit of a bid out there. So we're not quite flat in the skew, but we're somewhat close to a little bit of a bid for the puts. Uh, do you agree with that, listeners? Do you think maybe uh, one direction should be a little bit biased here that we're hanging out right around the two half level? In terms of action, what was the most active contract out here in Nat Gas this week? It wasn't actually in the April contract. It was going out to May. It was the two puts, 25,000 of the two puts. So the two strike just leading the dance yet again. The big day today, actually, 10,000 of them going up today, 6,800 on Monday, 4,200 on Tuesday. 3900 on Wednesday, pretty much opening all week long. And there is already size open interest on this strike. There's 51,000 contracts open on this strike. So they are not playing. Uh, Carly, does that surprise you that the two puts in May are leading the dance again this week? Or is that maybe kind of what you expected? Um, I don't, I'm not super shocked about that. I think that natural gas is the, is really a trend traders market. People really like to jump on the, on the bandwagon there. It wasn't that long ago. You and I were talking about 15 and $20 call options going for thousands of dollars. So it's just that kind of market. Yeah. I mean, you're right. It wasn't that long ago, but now we are <laughs> completely on the other <laughs> end of the spectrum here, right behind the listeners. Also the two puts looking pretty active out here in the April contract as well. I'm sorry, two half puts doing about 17,000 contracts this week. Uh, the big day for those actually Monday, a little over 9,000 on Monday, 8,300 today, 2,000 on Tuesday, about 2,000 on Wednesday as well. These were, actually, take it back. It's the two puts. My, my data is playing with me here a little bit. It was the two puts doing 21,000 contracts here this week in April, the big day, like I said, was Monday and back and forth opening to closing throughout the week. So a lot of paper on the two strike pretty much across the board. If you want to look for at the money contracts, you got to go up to the April two halves. They did about 17,000 this week. The big day for those was actually Wednesday, nearly 6,000 on a Wednesday. So kind of all over the place from a busy day perspective out here in that gas to pick a strike, pick an option. And they had their busiest day on different days. It seems like Uh, Monday, 4,800. 4,500 today and about 2,000 on on Tuesday. Again, back and forth opening to closing throughout the week on these two half puts here as well. So you got to dig a bit to find some call action. Looks like it's the April. Yeah, these are the April three calls doing a little over 14,000 contracts is the most active call on the list this week. Those busiest day was Monday, about 7,800. Looks like mostly closing there. So maybe some folks getting the heck out of Dodge as we plunged away from the three strike. 
Then we have about 3,500 going up today, 1,800 on Tuesday, and less than 1,000 on Wednesday. Again, kind of back and forth opening to closing the rest of the days, even though there are 63,000 contracts open there. So these psychologically important levels, the two, the two half, the three, not surprising that they are leading the dance. Let's go a little bit farther out. Let's go out to September. How about, let's say, a 3.1 put? <laughs> Those are the strikes out there. Apparently, it's like a 3.1, 3.2 put spread went up for size this week. 5,871 times on Wednesday and 5,000 times today. Again, this is in September, listeners. So maybe the person who was doing the $1 wide call verticals in WTI a few months ago, they've transitioned to 10th of a point wide put verticals in NatCast. Worth noting, it is opening on both legs. So they were, they were opening this for about 10,000, almost 11,000 contracts this week. We've seen weirder things, but uh, that certainly qualifies as weird. Listen, let's keep scrolling out. If we go all the way out, listeners, you might expect to see a little bit, uh, as Collier was alluding to, a little bit more call paper. Don't see a ton of it, which is interesting. If you go out to, oh my goodness, all the way out to January of 2025, we have 2,500 of the seven, nine call verticals going up. <laughs> so someone may be buying that spread or perhaps selling it. I don't know why you'd be selling that right now. That's intriguing, though. Uh, so there is some out-of-the-money call action. You just got to go all the way out to January of 20. Who can even think that far ahead when all this madness is gripping the market on a pretty much daily basis, listeners? And so much of the paper is going up expiring today, 2025. That just that just hurts my brain to even think out that far right now. So a bit of a weird week. Not exactly what I expected out here in NatGas this week. Anything else catching your eye in the world of NatGas? Carly, or anything else in the world of energy before we roll on into our next complex? No, I think it's interesting how crude oil is just literally going nowhere fast. I mean, everyone has, there's, everyone has an opinion in crude oil, but it hasn't seemed to move the market. <laughs> so it's been really quiet. You know, Carly, our number one dark side mover this week is the three-month sofer off nearly 12% this week. I'm, you know, I haven't really talked rates too much. You big on rates over there at the Carly? Uh, we do a lot with treasuries, not so much with the sofers or, you know, euro dollars it used to be. But uh, yeah, we we do some stuff there. Tell you what, we'll do a brief flirtation then with sofer and the treasuries as we head on into the rates. The Fed, the yield curve, inflation fears. How are they impacting options activity and volatility in your favorite interest rate products? Let's find out as we explore the world of rates. All right, everybody, welcome to the wonderful world of rates. Go into that drop down listeners over there at cmegroup.com slash TWIFO. Pop out of energy, go down three more slots to interest rates, then go into U.S. rates. And where we go from there, it's dealer's choice. Carly, it sounds like you're more active in perhaps the 10 year than you are in SOFR. Yep, 10 year and 30 years where we focus. So what's been catching your eye? Obviously, we've got Powell and company holding court yet again this week. That's always going to cause a little bit of consternation out there on the old yield curve. What was catching your eye out there this week in the rates? Uh, the interesting thing to me was the COT report issued by the CFTC. It's a commitment of traders report. Now, for full disclosure, we're, lo- we're guessing a little bit because there was a cyber event that's pre- uh, preventing the, the government from putting the data together in a timely manner like it normally does. But with all of that said, we believe there's probably the biggest or if not, uh, well, not the biggest, the second biggest net short position in 10-year note futures that we've ever seen. So everybody and their dog and their grandma is short the market. And at some point, they're going to have to probably buy back to get out. If they do it all at the same time, or if there's a lot of motivation behind it, it could get a really big short squeeze. So we're looking for something like that to happen. The last time that people were this bearish and this short treasuries was 2018. And we saw basically a two-year rally after that. So it could get interesting here. That's an impressive data out there, all the way back to 2018. So intriguing stuff, listeners. You folks out there slinging the rates. I know we have a lot of rate heads in the audience. They argue for rates every week here on the show. We can't do them every week, listeners. Uh, but I know a lot of you like to hang out in the 10-year note. Carly hangs out there, of course. Our buddy, Mr. Uncle Mike, over there on the Option Block show. He's always getting on the boat with the 10-year note, as he puts it. So we're going to hang out there this week. I think that's more relevant for a lot of you than the old three months sofer. But let me know if you guys are out there slinging sofer, we could certainly bring it up on the show as well. Sofer is just a ridiculous closing in on 10 million contracts. It's just a tsunami of paper. So there's not much analysis we can do out there. 10 year more manageable, even though it is 
still a ridiculous amount of paper, 2.3 million contracts on the tape this week, listeners. And of that, the April contract doing 35.7% of the paper. So we're going to hang out out in April. Listen, it has 15 days to go. I know it's somewhat counterintuitive for some of our listeners who don't play in the rates to hear us talking about the 10-year note, but then an option that expires in 15 days. It, the two juxtaposing expiration dates kind of blow their mind, but that's the rules of engagement out here in the rates, listeners. By the way, the 10-year hanging out, 111.15 right now, so up about 0.12, about a third of a percent, so not a huge mover week here on the old 10-year, but again, decent volume out here. Vol-wise, you don't come to the rates for vol outside of Let's say the front portion of three months so far that you can get up to triple digits sometimes. So that moves 10 year from a vol perspective, not so much. But that said, we are seeing some vol start to creep in on the screen. We're at about exactly a nine right now, up three quarters of a point. So that's no small move when you're starting at a baseline of about eight and a quarter to gain a three quarters of a point. That's actually nothing to sneeze at out there. So April 10 year getting a little bit frothier, a little bit more volatile this week. Skew-wise, kind of a same deal. You don't come to the 10-year for huge skew changes. Last week, the puts 1.5% bid. This week, about 3% bid. So puts catching a bit of a bid out here. The calls kind of hanging on. They were 4.3% cheap. Last week, 4.5% cheap. This week, so you got a little bit of a mini equity skew going on here with the puts bid. The calls slightly offered. And in terms of action, like we said, it was the April contract doing nearly 36% of the paper that led the dance this week. But the most active contract, you have to go actually out to June, listeners. It was the June one thirteen and a half. Remember, I said we're hanging out at about a one eleven fifteen in the futures. It was the one thirteen and a half call that led the dance this week with seventy eight, almost seventy nine thousand contracts. This is one of the one of the things I love about the Treasury complex. They could light up and do a ton of paper in a day, and then just completely shut off the next day. In the case of these one thirteen and a half calls, they traded. 71,706 yesterday, 842 today. Nobody wants to touch it. Yesterday, they did an did explosion of paper. The rest of the week, also not so much. 5,400 on Tuesday, on Monday, I should say. 1,000 on Tuesday, less than 1,000 today. So it just exploded on Wednesday. Of course, when Powell and company are chatting over there, that tends to dry paper in these products. We also saw the 111 and a half calls doing 63,000 contracts on Wednesday. So potentially a little bit of vertical action there as well. One eleven half, one thirteen half. The rest of the week kind of inconsequential. <laughs> For in fact, look at all these strikes. The rest of the week is going to be uh, pretty light as well. It's only when Powell speaking that it really drives a lot of the paper. Going back to April, the one ten puts also very active. Now this, unlike the calls, a little bit different. This was active all week long. The big day for these was actually Tuesday, 26,000. Then we had pretty much 14,000 each every other day of the rest of the week, all opening all week long. So a constant steady stream of 110 puts going up in April this week, as opposed to explosions <laughs> of upside calls on one day in June. So very interesting, very staccato paper on the call side versus steady, steady paper on the put side. 108 and a half puts also in April, also doing pretty active paper this week. 65,000 contracts there. Uh, the big day for that actually today, nearly 29,000 today, 25,000 yesterday, 9,000 on Tuesday, and then 2,000 on Monday. So a little bit lighter earlier in the week on that strike. So again, volume wise, we're kind of all over the place, which is strange. <laughs> you don't see a lot of products usually doing that outside of the rates. The rates kind of have their own rules of engagement and they will. They will turn on on a day, and then they will turn off the next day. Uh, 110 and a quarter puts. These are going out. Let's see. These are going out in a day. So these are uh, the weeklies in March here expiring tomorrow. These are pretty active all week long as well. So, again, talking about flirting with this zero-day stuff, we're seeing uh, 12,000 of these going up today. But the big day was actually Tuesday, 25, almost 26,000, followed by 16,000 on Wednesday, almost 11,000 on Monday, and 12,000 today. Kind of back and forth, opening to closing throughout the week. But again, these are very near dated contracts. So that's not entirely surprising. So a lot of paper going up here in your 10 year listeners. Hit us up. Are you, you've been trading uh, the 10 year? Are you flirting with? I know some of you like to play also via the various ETFs and ETPs out there. So I'm curious, what is your approach vector for the rates if you are trading out here? Hit us up. Let us know. You know where to find us at options. Most of the major social media platforms. If you're in the live, if you're on the pro, Hit us up via the members hotline 
or questions at theoptionsinsider.com. All those work, all those ways to get yourself onto the show. As we get ourselves into our next complex, things are lighting up out there. We have the E-mini NASDAQ in our light side movers and shakers this week. Again, I got a feeling it probably won't be there right now if I re-racked it because things are turning to the dark side out there in the equity. So let's head out there next. It's time to explore the volatility swings, skew changes, and hot options trades in your favorite indices. It's time to talk equities. All right, everybody. Welcome to the very tumultuous world of equities these days. Uh, head on out to the semigroup.com slash TWIFO. Pop out of rates. We're going to go up two slots to equity indices. Then we're going to U.S. index E-mini. And where we go from there, kind of a bit of a dealer's choice, kind of hard to avoid the, the juggernaut that is the E-mini S&P right now, but the NASDAQ also lighting it up, so we can maybe hang our hats out there as well. Before we get to all that, let's set the table from a vol perspective. And again, very much a tale of two markets. Earlier today, we would have told you vol was kind of down across the board. Now that we're seeing the sell-off get some teeth, vol actually turning, the worm turning out there, vol actually up. On the week right now, as we kicked off the show, VIX was at about a 2032, so up about 0.31. So almost it was almost exactly 20 on the show last week. VIX, so the vol of vol. And again, I've been talking about this for a while. When it gets down to about 75 listeners, got to start picking your head up and paying attention because it's probably not going to hang out there forever. That is the case this week. VIX up to over an 82, about 82 and a third. And now puts it up about 4.6 points from where it was this time last week. So vol itself. Getting more volatile. That's when you have to start paying attention. Vol Q, 2484. That's still down, but only down slightly, about a tenth of a point. That puts that VIX to Vol Q, so that S&P 500, with the skew, I should point out, there is a skew component to VIX, versus Vol Q, which is straight at the money vol. So it's not quite an apples to oranges. It's more like an oranges to tangerines comparison. But nonetheless, the VIX to Vol Q level hanging out right around four and a half. That's about four tenths of a point tighter than it was this time last week. Carly, I have to imagine these days with so many whipsaws, so much vol going on out there intraday in the major equity indices, your phones have to be ringing off the hook at the Carly with a lot of questions from your equity clients. What are you telling them? What's catching your eye out there in the world of equities these days? Uh, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And uh, one thing that we're kind of encouraging people to do is take a longer term perspective with their trading because in the short run, I, I you know, there's all kinds of reasons for the market being wild intraday. Uh, it's, you mentioned the zero data expiration options probably playing a part in it. And there's all kinds of uh, uncertainty as far as fundamentals. But if you take a step back and look at the big picture, there's some things to keep in mind. I Just recently, I mentioned that speculators are holding the second largest net short position in 10-year note. Well, they're getting close to holding one of, not probably not the biggest, but one of the biggest net short positions in the E-mini S&P futures. So that's interesting to me. Uh, that doesn't guarantee that we bottom out and turn on a dime, but it's a hint It's a hint that most of the selling has probably been done. I know on the portfolio side of things, a lot of there's a lot of cash on the sidelines. So if there's not any new fresh news to trigger a big sell-off, it's very possible that most of the people that are bearish have already expressed that opinion in the market. And so we've probably worked our way through the majority of the selling. Um, I'm still, believe it or not, I'm kind of bullish. As long as we hold like 3850 or 3900 in that ballpark, I think the path least resistance is higher for now. Interesting. You're joining the bull squad out here. Yeah. We have so many... So many great people on the network and so much, such a diversity of opinions on this market right now. I always joke in one of our shows this week, it's kind of like I'm the character in the cartoon and they have the angel and the demon on your shoulder, right? And they're both whispering in your ear at the same time. And the, the angels are the bulls and the demons are the shorts. And they're, they're both very loud and very vocal right now yeah. out there, Carly, which makes for an interesting market, also for a confusing one for a lot of our listeners. So let's see if we can lay down some data to help make it a little bit less confusing for you listeners. A pretty active week in the E-mini. We usually see about maybe two and a half million contracts or so on a decent week. Three and a quarter million contracts right now. So the E-mini lighting it up out there this week, listeners. Let's see. Obviously, you don't need me to tell you that it's the, <laughs> the near-dated contracts that are doing the lion's share of the paper. Once again, Folks picking up their nickels in front of the steamroller. 3,300, excuse me, 3,330 puts doing 68,000 contracts this week 
in the one day to go contract. So we'll kind of ignore those if you don't mind listeners. We'll look at some more, shall we say, relevant paper. And there is, there is 3,900 puts. By the way, we're hanging out at a 3,944 right now. So on the week, we're off 105 handles or 2.61%. So again, they are starting to come for this S&P. Now, maybe if you, if you buy into Carly's uh, net short futures position, maybe you think that's bullish. Maybe you think that's contrarian. Maybe you think all the selling energy is spent. I'm curious. Hit us up. Let us know. You folks have no shortage of opinions on all things equity direction out here. But the big dog this week, in terms of relevant paper, we have the 3,900 puts going out in a day, listeners. And these were, as you might expect, pretty active all week long, doing 42, almost 43,000 contracts. The big dog for them was Wednesday, 16,200 on Wednesday, 11,000 today. Seven, almost 8,000 on Monday and 6,800 on Tuesday. So they were active all week long, opening all week long. So yeah, we have a total of 42,000. The OI is only 14,000. So it seems like a lot of churning and burning going on on the 3,900 strike, which again, makes some sense, a psychologically important level. Can we hit 3,900 by tomorrow's expiration? <laughs> it might be a tall order, but then again, given what we're seeing out there in these markets these days, I mean, we're off over 60 handles today. In the S and P, we are closing in on that level, so nothing is out of the realm of possibility at this point, listeners. But still, an intriguing amount of paper here. And then let's see, right behind that, we also have the going out in a few minutes. I better click on these soon before before the data leaves, <laughs> here, listeners. We also have a lot of thirty nine hundred puts going out effectively right now, listeners. They were trading pretty actively all week long as well. The big day for these actually today, almost. 21, almost 22,000 traded this week, 19,300 going up today. So a lot of you piling into the 3,900 puts that are going out in, I don't know, 10 minutes, <laughs> close to that. Uh, so it's going to come down to the wire, I think, for you folks out there, listeners. But uh, intriguing stuff. Again, this goes back to this whole zero-day phenomenon. And again, you don't need contracts listed today in order to trade zero-day. It can be a weekly contract. You just trade it. Uh, coming into expiration <laughs> and it's still effectively a zero day for you right people clearly liking those today uh, trading a ton of those the 3990s also pretty active also going out in a few minutes 16 almost 17000 of those going up just today again a total of only 19000 trading on the week so today just a banger day for near dated puts not exactly surprising we are falling out of bed in the S&P and again 3990 puts if you bought some of those this morning, you're looking pretty good right now. If you were if you were diving into the fire and selling those, well, you are a brave soul. And alas, it didn't seem like it worked out for you too well. A 4,000 puts, that's more of a strike you might expect to be lighting it up. Also pretty active. These also going out in just a few minutes. 16,000 of those, again, 13,000 of them going up today. So, I mean, the, the story of equities, listeners, continues to be very near dated, zero day, all the time. That is also our question of the week. Maybe we'll have a chance to get to that a little bit later in our question of the week for our futures options feedback. If we get a little bit beyond the today tsunami, which again, if you go out four days, <laughs> you go out four days to this March contract expiring in four days, we have the 38 half puts doing 31,000 contracts this week, 21,000 today, and then opening throughout the rest of the week, 28,000 of the 3,900 puts. So, it's not all expiring today, but it's all very near dated paper nonetheless, listeners. So just a a tsunami of paper on that near dated stuff. If we go a little bit farther out, all the way to, dare I say it, almost eight days. Eternity in equities these days. The 3,800 puts also lighting it up out there, doing about 27, almost 28,000 in these March 3,800 puts again. And actually, the big day for these, not today, it was actually Wednesday, 10,000 on Wednesday, 9,300 today. So closing in on it today. Uh, 5,800 on Tuesday, 3,100 on Monday. And again, opening all week long. So a ton of put paper here in the front day and indeed front week for the E-mini S&P 500. I don't think I'm telling you anything that is too surprising here. Listen, let's see if we can go a little bit farther out. Uh, once again, we have someone doing that ridiculous box with the par calls in March. <laughs> they did it 11,000 times this week. We'll, we'll ignore that paper this week. Listen, but if we keep going farther out, it still is. All puts all the time. We go out all the way 14 days. It seems like I'm going out two years. Listen, I'm only going out 14 days. These are the 39 quarter puts. They have done about 11,000 contracts. These, 
weirdly enough, we're only trading today and Tuesday. 5,700 today, 5,000 on Tuesday. Closing on Tuesday. Looks like opening today because there's only 3,000 contracts opening on this strike. So uh, intriguing stuff here. Again, a little bit farther out. There is some upside paper to be found. 42 halves. <laughs> if you go out to uh, 36 days to some of the April contracts, 42 halves trading nearly 6,000 times this week. So there is a little bit of call paper to be found. And almost all of that today looks like it was a 42 half, 43 half vertical that went up today. Again, 4,859 times all opening on that bad boy. So you like that listeners are pretty much a one month, 42 half, 43 half vertical. I don't have the prices here, but would you rather be a seller or a buyer of that right now? I think we can revert or maybe you just fading the hell out of this, but just in case the worst comes to pass, you're buying the 43 halves against it to protect it. Which way would you rather have that one on listeners? I'm curious. As we keep on rolling, there's a lot of stuff we can get to here in equities, but there are some other complexes that are lighting it up. Before we get some of the listeners, Carly, any other complexes on your tape you want to talk about on the show this week? Uh, We've seen a pretty interesting week in grains. Ah, yes. To the ags we go, listeners. It's time to get our hands dirty exploring the latest options, trades, and trends in corn, wheat, soybeans, and more. It's time to talk ags. All right, listeners, welcome to the wonderful world of ags. Let's get our hands dirty here. Let's go all the way up to the top of the asset class list to agriculture. Then you have an embarrassment of riches there. You got corn, you got grains and oil seeds, wheat, soybeans, livestock, dairy, softs, and of course, another grains categories there. By the way, we had a lot of ags on our light side this week. Oats leading the dance up 5%. Feeder cattle, again, also in the ags, up 3.39%. Soybean meal up 2.63%. Lean hogs for number four, up 2.3%. Pretty much the entirety of the light side this week was ags, with the exception of number five, the E-mini NASDAQ. So a lot of ags this week. Carly, what was catching your eye out there in the world of ags this week? Uh, I had my eye on soy meal and wheat. Extended trends. What was what was catching your eye? Soybean meal has been lighting yeah. it up on our tape for a while now. We have talked about it more, I would say, over the past couple of months than maybe in the last few years combined. Soybean meal. Uh, definitely lighting it up. Like I said, this week up 2.63%. What was catching your eye out there in the world of soybean meal this week, Carl? So the the initial rally in soybean meal occurred like late November, early December. And it was uh, basically the result of an unwinding of a spread between soybean meal and soybean oil. The oil uh, unwound itself and came back down to where it was trading before mostly. But meal has not done that. In fact, meal just continues to press higher. I'm not sure... Some people would argue with me, but I'm not sure the fundamentals support this. Um, And we're coming up against a couple things. The COT report is telling us there's probably the largest net long position in soy meal ever, or at least really close. Uh, We're coming up against $500 in price, and that's both the trend line resistance and psychological resistance, and everybody's long. And so I just feel like it's an accident waiting to happen. Let's see if we can analyze that accident in real time out here. Get into that asset class drop down for ags. Listeners, go into the grains and oil seeds. Then we're going to go down four slots to the soybean meal. As you'll see, as Carly was laying down there, a pretty active week for soybean meal. Nearly 100,000 contracts on the tape, about 95,000 right now. So a pretty active week for good old soybean meal. And of that, a little over 40%, about 41% going up in... The May contract that has about, looks like about 43 days to go. So we're going to hang out out there, listeners. Where are the soybean meal futures right now? 487.7 right now, up about 6.4 handles or about 1.3%. Just since Monday, of course, you go back to last week's show, it's up about 2.63%. So a pretty active week for soybean meal. What is the vol out here? You might be wondering about a 22 even, up about one and a quarter points. So Again, it's kind of hanging at about the same level as a VIX right now. So if you're looking for something else that's at a similar volatility level that actually does some paper, well, soybean meal is your huckleberry this week. In terms of skew, we got the puts last week were pretty heavily bid, and the calls were kind of flat. The puts were about 3% bid. The calls, nobody cared. Uh, this week, the puts have swung in the other direction. They're about 1.3% cheap. And the calls catching a little bit of a lift, 1.5% bid. So you have a slight bid to the calls but nothing crazy out there this week. And in terms of action, let's see what was leading the dance out here for the beans, the soybean meal. It was for the 495 calls. Remember I said we're hanging out at a 487.7 right now, listeners. 
The 495 calls out here in May were leading the dance to the tune of about 7,000 contracts. And we had two big days, Tuesday 2,500 and Monday about 2,400. Opening on Monday, closing on Tuesday. So maybe they made their money and got the heck out of Dodge in one day. Actually, looks like it might have been a bit of a vertical, a 495, 490 vertical going up on Monday about 25, 2,600 times. And then we saw just the 495 calls trading on Tuesday. And then about 1,200 on Wednesday. It looks like actually might, might have been a vertical again. So it might have traded about 25, 2,600 of that vertical on Monday and about 12 to 1,300 of it on Wednesday. And then we have some weird pockets of paper, 2,500 of the 495s going up on Tuesday, closing there, and then 1,500 of the 490s going up today. Obviously, we don't know what the deal is with today's paper. So interesting back and forth on these 490 and 495s, maybe some rolling going on during the week, especially earlier in the week, maybe closing on the 490s and rolling up to the 495s. They thought maybe we were going to break through that strike. Maybe we briefly flirted with it. And then putting it back on later in the week. Again, looks like it was closing again later in the week, though. So maybe taking more off as the week went. And then just closing a bunch of the 495 straight up on Tuesday. If that's related paper. It's all very strange. But <laughs> that's what the tape is telling us out here this week. And followed behind it by the 500. So the par calls going up 5,200 times. Uh, they were pretty active all week long. 1,700 was the big day. That was on Tuesday. A 1,300 on Monday and Wednesday. And about a thousand today. So pretty active all week long. And again, back and forth opening to closing all week long as well. So activity on the 500 strike out here in May. Let's go a little bit farther. See what else we can find. The five half calls were active out here in July here. These are interesting. Doing about nearly 4,000 contracts. Uh, the big day is today 1,500 today, 1,300 on Tuesday mostly opening there, and then the rest kind of scattered throughout the week. So about 4,000 going up of the five half calls in July. And then we have back to the par as the 500 calls. These are here in April. So these only have about 15 days to go. And these were pretty active this week as well, doing about 3,500 contracts. Uh, the big day is today, 1,300, about almost 1,000 on Monday, slightly closing there, almost 1,000 yesterday as well, slightly opening there and only a few hundred on Tuesday. So a lot of back and forth paper, a lot of stuff centered around this 500 strike or close to, which again is not surprising. That's pretty much where we're hanging out right now in terms of strikes out here in soybean meal. You folks slinging the eggs. I know we've had some inquiries for a lot of the big ones like corn and wheat. Soybean meal may be a little bit farther afield for some of you, but if you're intrigued, I mean, it does have some volume. It does have some volatility. You could certainly do worse than maybe kicking the tires out here as well. We could certainly do worse than answering the, some of your questions. So let's get to it. A little bit of your futures options feedback. It's time for your questions, comments, and insights. It's time for futures options feedback. Submit your questions at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, stocktwits.com slash options insider, or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com. You can also submit your feedback via our Options Insider Radio Network mobile app, available for iOS, Android, and Kindle Fire devices. You can even ask your questions live via our Mixler chat room. So grab the Mixler app or just search for Options Insider at mixler.com. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com. All right, everybody, welcome to the feedback segments. You folks have a lot of thoughts on a lot of different things, including in our question of the week. We had a couple of them last week, one of them very relevant to this show. One of them was actually born out of this show. We had a quick flash poll during last week's TWIFO because we were joking about the DS 30 puts being very active last week in WTI when we were still hanging out in the high 70s. It seemed like a kind of a weird strike, so we thought we'd put it out to you folks. Are you a buyer or a seller of the December 30 puts when we were in, I think it was around a 78 in WTI at the time. And Carly, not surprisingly, 85.7% of our audience chose to sell them. Only 14% chose to buy them. I'm surprised it was that high, to be precise. <laughs> Does these numbers surprise you, Carly? I, I'm guessing no. Uh, no, not at all. Although I'm not sure what those 30 puts are going for, but probably not 
enough premium. Yeah, to you're not getting a hell of a lot of juice. I guess they're deciding, <laughs> yeah. hey, if it gets down to 30, I don't mind picking up some WTI in the old back That's pocket. True. So I could That's certainly, true. I could certainly, I'll have to go pull up what the prices were, but it was weird on a tsunami of these 30 puts going up last week. You know, that's why we do the show. Weird stuff comes across the radar that you wouldn't expect. Uh, speaking of weird stuff, Carly, we also had a question of the week last week. I'm curious to get your thoughts on this as well. We were just talking about all this near dated stuff going up in the equities and just what an explosion of paper that is and really how transformative that is from even a year ago or even six months ago when the markets were very different in the equities. They were near dated, of course, but nowhere near to this extreme. So this has led us to a lot of questions about this. Last week, we asked everybody, is this zero-day explosion in the S&P 500? Is this increasing intraday volatility? Our audience came down on the side of yes, Carly, about 61% and about 39% saying no. I'm curious for you, do you agree with our audience? Think they are increasing volatility intraday or you take the other side of that? Um, I'm going to lean toward yes. Of course, um it's hard to pinpoint where the volatility is coming from. There's a lot of moving parts. Since 2020, we've just had a tsunami of black swans and chaos. Uh, some of it government-induced, some of it just natural <laughs> disasters. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm going to say yes, though. I definitely lean that way as well. Our audience leans that way as well. So obviously, a lot of savvy folks, they can always say you can tell a genius because they think exactly like you out there. A lot of geniuses floating around in our audience. Obviously, I think the numbers still need to be crunched in terms of the hard data. We have a lot of anecdotal evidence right now. We still need hard empirical data to determine one way or the other. But it is an intriguing question. And again, I don't think we really understand fully the ramifications of this, this massive shift to zero-day trading. Before we get out of here, Carly, we had a, a question slash comment from one of our pro members earlier this week. Mr. Tony, don't it be? He wrote in, I love saying his name like that. I don't know why. He's not Italian. It just sounds more fun that way. But Tony wrote in to say uh, he had some quick thoughts. One of our other guests, he said, scared him with his talk of uh, waiting for a large sell-off after Q2 or Q3. He said he was starting to get too bullish. So he took the opportunity of the rally last Friday to uh, curtail his position. And now he's flat and he's waiting for what happens with the market over the next few months. Uh, but I bring this up, Carly, because you mentioned in his comment, he put, as an aside, I wanted to thank Carly Garner for her explanation of call ladders in the commodity space. Not that I am an expert at all, but the call ladders really helped me get out of a natural gas futures position, which was looking bleak. So there you go, Carly. Our conversations about nat gas call ladders, it saved Tony P. Perfect. I love to hear that. <laughs> so there you go. Our pro listeners, they're enjoying. It says, thanks to all your contributors. Their insights are priceless. Uh, P.S. Why haven't I won a pro trading crate yet? Well, <laughs> hang in there. Hang in there, Tony. Uh, the needle will come around to everyone eventually. Again, you got to, I don't pick them. <laughs> it goes all to the random number generator at the end of the day. So you got to be down with the random number gods. And if they smile upon you that week, then you too, Tony P. It sounds like you're winning already with your Nat Gas futures position. You got out of that. So, and you're not participating on this sell off in the market. So it sounds like you're already winning there, Tony. But nonetheless, uh, keep plugging away and maybe a pro trading crate someday will be yours. All right, listeners. Unfortunately, that music means we've come to the end of another epic sojourn through the world of all things futures options. But before we go, Carly, if folks want to check out what you guys and gals are working on over there in the land of the Carly trading, where should they go? What should they do? Uh, the best place to reach us is www.decarleytrading.com. It's spelled D-E-C-A-R-L-E-Y, trading.com. You can sign up for a free trial of newsletters. There's quite a few educational videos on the site, and you can kind of just see uh, some of the things that we're doing as far as strategies and ideas and market analysis. And before we roll out, anything you want to plug, any upcoming research, maybe a new book, uh, anything you got uh, on the horizon you want to tease our listeners with? I don't have anything fresh coming out. I'm on the book writing hiatus. It's a lot of work, but I do have uh, three relatively recent books that uh, you can find on Amazon. So if you search for DeCarly, or I'm sorry, Carly Garner on Amazon, they'll all come up. There you go, listeners. They are trading commodity options with creativity, higher probability commodity trading, and a trader's first book on commodities. I know for a lot of you, maybe trying to dip your toes into things like soybean meal, some of the other products we're talking about today, that trader's first book on commodities 
maybe a good starting point for you. And of course, you know where to go to start all of your futures options analysis. Simigroup.com slash TWIFO, T-W-I-F-O, is the place to go to kick the tires and light the fires. We like you folks, so we give you all kinds of great free data <laughs> every week. Of course, if you want more, only one place to go, Bantix.com, B-A-N-T-I-X.com is the place to go to upgrade to the full offering over there in the land of Quick Strike. That is going to do it for us on the network today. Don't worry. Back again tomorrow, noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern for Volatility Views. We're going to break down this mad week from a vol perspective out there. And then back again for all of you pro folks, including Don't It, Don't It Be, on Options Oddities tomorrow after Volatility Views to break down the entire crazy week from an unusual activity perspective. Then we're back again next week. Kicking it all off on Monday with the option block and the crypto rundown. Rest of the middle of the week, I will be traveling down to the big Futures Industry Association conference next week. So there's chances I will be beaming into the show remotely next week. So look forward to that. But we will have Twifo at its same bat time, same bat channel next week. Until then, stay safe out there, everybody. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This broadcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and does not constitute trading advice or the solicitation of purchases or sale of any futures or options. The rulebook of the applicable exchange should be consulted as the authoritative source on all current contract specifications. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash The Options Insider, or via questions at TheOptionsInsider.com.